Battery RCA mobilized in Red Deer, uh, met in Shiloh on October 14, 1942, to form part of the 13th Field Regiment RCA. Uh, in England, the regiment drew 25 pounders and trained with the 3rd Canadian Division of Scotland for a year. In September 1943, uh, 13th Field Regiment um, turned in their 25 pounders and drew the Priest 105mm self propelled gun and trained in Bournemouth in order to continue assault training. Um, those are now. Those are fairly small guns compared to what we're talking. About. Well, the one actually the 105 uh, that they switched to the 105 SP is the same caliber as the one on the floor, yeah. and the the basic platform is identical. Um, so those are the kind of guns that they would have been using during the war. Yeah, and well, actually, and the one that's out front is a monument. Uh, the, that's a 25 pounder. Um, uh, it's an 88 millimeter. Yeah. Uh, on the 6th of June, 1944. The regiment hit the beach at Fort sur mer It was to support the attack of the 7th Canadian Infantry Brigade, which consisted of the Royal Regiment of Canada, Royal Winnipeg Rifles, and the Canadian Scottish Regiment. What was the date on that? That was 6th of June, 1944. D-Day, yeah. Alright guys, so um, when you guys are finished uh, getting most of the surface bare metal and whatnot, we're going to get the gym bearings. I don't think they've been done for a while. So. Okay, I'm just like... Moving and the regiment continued on in Northwest Europe in such places as Bonol, Calais, the Scheldt, Wartburg, Nijmegen, Millimagen. And in 1944, Operation Veritable, Operation Blockbuster, Antwerp, June, and Bulls Ward on the 16th of April 1945. Can you draw me a picture of what would have been happening here back home? While all this was going on over there, and how most likely they were they were continuing on just recruiting and training and c recruiting people, sending them off to Shiloh for artillery training, and then shipping them to England as replacements for people who were for troops that were killed. 
So, I mean, pretty much when they mobilized, they packed everybody up and shipped them off to Shiloh. And how long from the, the time that you were recruited to the time you had a beach? I, have, I would have to actually go and look that up. I, I'm not entirely certain. And this building right here, this was this was Camp A, I believe A20. A20. And it's the, uh, did you go and take a picture of the plaque over by the Memorial Center? Not yet. It was essentially a training base for the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps. So like mechanics and all that other stuff. So that's essentially what this area was. But this was also one of the main infrastructure areas for a lot of the Commonwealth Air Training programs around here. Because you know, there was one out in Penhold, there was one in... Bowden, what's currently Bowdoin Institution, and actually, because I work out there, and I went and actually went into the the uh, the engineering shop and looked at their their blueprints, and in there and sections of the blueprint when they talk about the perimeter road is like paved service over surface over a previously paved runway, <laughs> things like that, and and when you look at the photos from the air, you can actually see the triangle where the trees grow on what the edges, what the taxiway and the runways were, and you can actually see that from the air still. I, I went and researched it on the internet a little mm -hmm. bit after I came back. Yeah. And there does, it doesn't say anything about where the pen, how it started, Bowdoin Institution started, or or that it was a military infrastructure. And yeah. Same thing with... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's 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 not a heck of a lot of information on, like, no one's actually really compiled, you know, like, say, a section in a museum, like the Museum of the Regiments, that, that go, okay, here's a list of all where all the Commonwealth Air Training program bases were and here's what they did at each one I think it's been more it seems like it's been more the communities where where they were uh, whether or not they have kept that uh, that history like uh, Nanton mm -hmm. prime example Nanton was a was a Commonwealth Air Training program and you know they bought that they uh, a farmer bought that Lancaster and then they the town bought it and put it on that pedestal and finally it was deteriorating so they built a hangar around it but I mean if you've ever been there, they have the flight board, like the actual chalkboard, from the last day, like when Germany surrendered, and it shows what pilot candidates were up at, who their instructors were, and what time they were supposed to fly. Economy and a population which is relatively new and growing and very forward-looking. I don't think generally in Western Canada that we spend a lot of time reflecting on our history. Uh, I think if you went into parts of Canada where military service has been a very big part of the economy and of the community and where many families have been attached to it for generations uh, or where there's deep history in, in any uh, you know, and in any line of work, that there would be a stronger memory and probably more commitment to keeping those historical artifacts and, and uh, stories in, in uh, the dialect. 
we're very young. We're very forward-looking. Increasingly, we have people in our economy here in Alberta, especially, which haven't been born here, uh, which don't have a sense of our history, uh, and, and who are developing their own story. So I think we don't generally, in a very general way, celebrate our history quite the same way older parts of the country do. And I think that's true when you look at our military infrastructure and our military history and the service uh, that many of our families, uh, many of our long-standing families have given to that. Could you give me an example of one of the people that would still be alive? Uh, let's see, I believe... Oh, I'll have to look at Brown. Got Brown. He was, uh, I believe he was uh, up until about four years ago, living in uh, Lacombe, if I remember correctly, if I remember the name correctly. And her CT Brown. Yeah. Well, it's probably fairly well documented, but it's a shorter history, uh, and it is uh, not as not as celebrated and not as much a part of the history of individuals and their families, because so many people just didn't grow up here. Uh, they come from somewhere else, attracted by what Alberta has to offer. So we probably have to work harder to get our historical story into everyone's. Uh, field of vision. Um, um. So this is uh, 194th Overseas Battalion in 1916. Where is that? Uh, this is in taken in Toronto. Uh, this is 20th Field Brigade in uh, uh, prior prior to World War, or well actually in 1939 at, on, during the Royal Visit. So it would have been the summer of 39 prior to the outbreak of World War II. Mm, that looks like, in, is it in Edmonton? That's in Edmonton, that's at the Prince of Wales Armory. Yeah, so this is right after World War II, 78 anti-tank battery, after, after World War II. At the end of World War II, 78 battery had been converted to uh, uh, anti-tank self-propelled. And then after the war, they became just a self-propelled. That's a 17-pounder anti-tank gun. And then down here is uh, officers of 13th Field Regiment, um, actually in Halifax Harbor after arriving back in 1946. So um, then Colonel Cormack is the second from the right. So why is, he, is Colonel Cormack so significant? So he's a local guy. He was the, the, the battery commander, 7-8 battery, and then uh, went over as regimental commander. Actually, another member uh, you know, of the regiment that's fairly well known is Brigadier Ziegler, who was the uh, BC of 6 1 battery. He fired the largest artillery concentration during World War II.
Cross line, you got that wrench? Record as Charlie Sierra, 1101. That's what you need me. Okay. I need a runner. Sergeant Danger, let's go. Did you say send it over the radio? You're going to be running. Okay. Get your shit off. FFO. What is that? My name is Lieutenant Colonel Daryl Paquette. I'm a commanding officer of 20th Field Artillery Regiment, which is a reserve artillery uh, unit located in Edmonton and Red Deer, Alberta, which is part of the 41 CBG. Uh, yeah, primarily my job is a uh, commanding officer. We're here to uh, train these reserve uh, soldiers. Uh, we also have soldiers with us from uh, 20th Independent Field Battery, which is a reserve artillery unit located in Lethbridge. And uh, what we're doing out here is uh, validating our battle task uh, standards for artillerymen and mortarmen training here at the conclusion of our, our training year, which runs alongside the federal fiscal cycle. So uh, we're getting together with another unit and uh, working on our, our artillerymen skills. And how is the exercise going so far? Well, uh, the weather in Southfield is always a pleasant surprise. It's nice and windy in uh, southern Alberta, of course, the snow's melting a lot quicker than northern Alberta. And uh, we've got a nice uh, mud bog out here now, and uh, the troops are working hard, and they've got very difficult conditions to be working through with the wind, uh, the weather, and of course, the muck is, is the biggest uh, issue out here right now with trucks getting stuck and you know guys up to their ankles in uh, it's pea soup mud, I guess. Is that something that you can expect? Well, hey, uh, I think only the regimental sergeant major controls the weather ever in an army exercise, so uh, I think Canadian soldiers are well adept to adapting to any kind of conditions that they're in. Uh, that's what part of being Canadian is all about, is that uh, we're very, very proficient no matter what the situations bring to us, especially when it comes to the weather, because, uh, I don't know, being Albertan all my life, you can never ever predict the weather, let alone in July. Warrant Officer Quinn Giller, 6-1 Battery, Battery Sergeant Major. So the problem we're currently facing right now is the fire missions that we're getting. We are uh, originally laid in on a center of art. The problem we face is sometimes in where they're like we have right now, where we're actually working on top of a couple layer of a couple inches layer of permafrost. So it's not getting retarded. And then we got a little bit of mud and snow and everything else. It's starting to melt just barely, so we have a slick surface. Our problem that we're facing is when we start moving out of that cone of fire, our properly embedded trails that we start our day with are now on top of that slick, greasy surface, and they're not digging into that permafrost the way we want them to, despite trying to ride in the trails. So we've had one gun over on our flank here, the number two gun, which has actually slid back about seven feet during that and earned a lot of displacement, therefore making it difficult to fire that gun accurately at those distances. And then we have to bring the gun back into action through other things like one-ups, or we have to re-record the gun on the whole. And, uh, and that can be, it can be time consuming, once again, when there's people downrange waiting for those bullets to fall. Right, watch out, all right, two back to two gun. So now we're seeing basically the gun coming back into action, right? How long do you think it'll take? Right now, the way we're looking, well, we've got gun three back in action, it looks like. Looks like Ilfow is back in action over here on gun number one. Chris, you running your rock? You're good? What? You're still in mission, but you're still able to fire? No. We can run up, but we're just going to be just playing. Okay. Well, get the run up done and dig them in best you can, right? going to be doggy. I said we're out of action because I don't even know if we're on or the anymore. I'd do a quick compass shot as well, too, eh? Fine. Yeah, now I can do that. Bombardier Caleb Von Albedo, I'm with the 20th Field Regiment, 78th Field Battery. How long have you been with the regiment? With the regiment, I've been for three and a half years now. How's it treating you? It's good. It's good. I enjoy it so far. So.
how often you come out, out in an exercise like this. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is the, the, the high point. Yeah, yeah, this is what I joined to do. So I try to make it on every exercise. Now that I'm a full time, I, I do make it on every exercise. So. I'm assuming that what's happening right now is probably not very good. Well, it's not that it's not good. Everything has its training purpose. You know, you got to figure out what to do when there is nothing to do. You can you can work on your battery position. You can improve. There's always improvements to be made. Um, as far as a good exercise go, it's just the training value that you get and uh, how much fun you can have. And with the group guys that I have here, we have a lot of fun. So. straight down that's super quick so it means it functions as soon as it hits something and then if you turn it to delay that means it'll punch through a little bit and then detonate and then this one here is a time fuse so it's actually got like a scale inside that we can move and then we have these ones are those electronic fuses that we can send uh, set without with a wand what would be the different applications for the different types of fuses? Oh, let's look at one. Um, okay, so like HE, uh, basically we want it to detonate when it hits a target, right? So, whereas like smoke, uh, we may want it to function uh, at a set time. Um, where that other fuse, we can set it to a time, proximity, point detonating, or delay. So that, one, that expensive one is kind of like a jack of all trades fuse more options for sure, and it's a bit easier to use. Now who's in charge of this? Who does that? Uh, I like managing the ammunition. Well, it's a, it's a group effort. Okay. I'm Bombardier Holtz. Uh, my position uh, was 7-8 uh, field battery and 20 field regiment. I'm a CP technician. Uh, so basically, I, uh, I come up with the data for the guns, for them to shoot. So from the, uh, the observer point, they, uh, they give us uh, what they see, and then we interpret that into uh, gun firing data so that we could uh, uh, hit the targets on the ground. I feel like I joined more to serve my country. The excitement is kind of a plus. You learn a lot? Oh yeah. There's always something new. This is actually my first time as a command post technician in the live fire training area. So it really sees how I could work that out in a real life situation. Did you see a, a tank sitting at a fair somewhere that prompted you or did you see it on the internet? Or? Uh, no, not really. Actually, well, my brother has been in the reserve as well. He's been in for probably like 13, 14 years. That's kind of told. Yeah. So um, that was kind of, you know, I knew a lot about the military and I was just curious to try, so I just went out and signed up. Hey, you only fired one, Chris? You only fired one. You still got four bang bang to 20 seconds apart, eh? The view setting is 17.5, not 1.75. Come on! Come on. Hey. Seventy field battery has a has a very long future in Red Deer. It goes through the typical cycles of having uh, high membership to low membership, and, and that's that is I think the, pretty much the nature of any reserve unit. You'll have highs and lows. Um, but I mean, when I joined, there was four there was only four or five members of seven eight battery that paraded on a regular basis, and then I went through a period where. We average 60 or 70 guys parading per night. You know, it's not like the East Coast or Central Canada where the reserves is a good job because it's actually a job and you can't get one anywhere else. Whereas in Alberta, it's uh, everybody's got a job. <laughs> One round.